to the EFTA roundtable discussion. Uh, tonight is going to be myths and about DMX and RDM. So, uh, quick note up front about uh, about this presentation is uh, it is being recorded. So please uh, know that it be made available for public consumption later on. So, without any further ado, we're recording. Good deal. Let me uh, continue on. So, first off, if you're uh, if you're not speaking, I ask that you do please mute your microphone for those of you who are online. So, first, uh, some introductions going in alphabetical order. We'll each introduce ourselves. Hi, I'm Scott Blair. I work uh, with BER. Uh, previously, I worked at uh, High End Systems. I've been an engineer there for many years, and also the uh, chair of the RDM broadcaster. Thanks much. And I'm Milton Davis. I work as an engineer for Doug Fleener Design, and I'm also an ETCP recognized trainer and electrician. And I uh, have the honor of uh, sort of kind of hosting this tonight with my fellow panelists, and also next on the list. Bob uh, Goddard, Goddard Design Company. Uh, we build the MX 512 distribution and test equipment, and some other stuff too sometimes. Great, thanks. And we were originally going to have Eric Johnson here again tonight, but uh, he was not able to make it, so we send our regards to him. Never mind. Oh, Eric has uh, entered. Eric, if you're available, can you introduce yourself? His audio may still be uh, joining. He's joining us. He'll be on here in just a moment here. Oh, and here he comes. Hey, Eric, you there? Yes, sir. Hi, we were just doing introductions. Please tell us who uh, who you are. Certainly, I am Eric Johnson, and I've been volunteering with the CPWG for, I don't know, 10 years or so now. Good deal. Thanks very much. So. Let's go ahead and get this uh, get this started this evening. First, we have uh, a few little assumptions about uh, what each of us, uh, what we're assuming that you know. First, that you know what DMX 512 is and that you've used it in some form in the past. Also, that you're at least aware of what RDM is and that or that you've heard of it and have some idea of uh, how it might be applied. And third. And most importantly, that you are willing to part with some of your beliefs that you may have about both of those protocols. There's been a lot of misinformation over the decades. And remember, DMX is coming up on 30 years of, uh, of being around. So 31 years of uh, being around. And uh, there have been a lot of time for a lot of myths and misinformation to propagate. And so a lot of us here have been trying to get the correct information out there uh, because there is so much in misinformation. So our hope is that we can document the things that we've been saying for some time and uh, just make it public record so that we have a nice reference. I think there's also one other you know, important thing to, to note here is uh, you and I were talking about earlier, Milton, is that you know, everybody out there seems has their own YouTube videos or other things explaining DMX, and uh, normally often it's uh, you know maybe a DJ that has a little bit of understanding of it. So there's a lot of a lot of misinformation we've seen over the years in various videos. Um, this is probably one of the only ones you'll find that is actually uh, being made by you know those of us on the uh, task group that uh, have actually written the uh, written the documents. So it's it's hard to get the, you know more authoritative source and uh, hopefully we'll hear tonight on the topic. Absolutely. And uh, also during the during the course of our discussion tonight, uh, the chat room is being monitored. So if you have questions, please put them into the chat window. And for those of you who are ETCP certified electricians, uh, this session is good for half an hour of credit towards your renewal. Okay, so we ready to roll? Bring up some myths. A lot of all of this stuff is thing questions and comments and opinions that we've heard over the years, and uh, and hopefully dispelling the myth. So myth number one, and I, I've heard this a lot of recent, 
that the maximum DMX cable run length is 300 feet. Okay, that is a myth. Well, and it comes about for a good reason. The main, one well, of the first reasons is if we read the DMX 512 standard, the standard is very, very clear on this subject. It says that cable requirements and premises wiring are not within the scope of the standard. Okay, well, so the standard isn't going to tell us how long we can run a DMX cable. Well, there is, in fact, a recommended practice that talks about cabling for DMX 512. And that's very specific in saying it's beyond the scope of the recommended practice to determine maximum run length that will apply in all possible installations. I won't read the rest of it. You can read it for yourself. But the bottom line there is that the standard and the recommended practice tell you absolutely nothing about what the maximum cable run length is for DMX 512. So what is the maximum run length? Okay, let's take a quick poll. Who thinks, what is the maximum run length? Scott, what do you think? Um, it depends. It depends a lot on how many devices you're going to have on. If you're talking from just one, from a controller to one device, um, you, know, you might be able to get to a thousand feet. But if I've got a lot of devices on there, a couple hundred feet is going to be all I'm going to do. Bob, how about yourself? I would say that there's an awful lot of feet, particularly if you're willing to put a splitter on the end. And um, and you're using good quality cable. Um, that would uh, that would be my feeling. The, key, the word quality is a bit airy fairy, but what we can refer back to is the underlying electrical standard that DMX is based on. And the documentation about the EIA 485 standard does speak to cable characteristics, and that in turn allows you to run certain distances. And so yes, the, to my point of view. A thousand feet is a good ballpark figure, um, but it does depend on using the appropriate cable for the job in hand. So what you can tell by all this is that even amongst those of us who are part of authoring the standard, there's minor differences of opinion. But I can tell you for sure that 300 feet is way short in 99.9% in of the situations. The recommended practice for DMX 512 does in fact have a recommendation of about a thousand feet. I've had personal experience of running DMX over 5,000 feet over a single run and being successful. Uh, wouldn't recommend it unless you really, uh, really know what's going on and are, you're in complete control of the situation. So, do you yeah. think that the, rec the feeling of 300 feet is people have taken the Ethernet cable in the leg and substituted the pawn? DMX 512. That's exactly what they've done. They, they've read the 100 meter or about 330 feet and said, ah, Ethernet, DMX must be the same. In fact, DMX is going to be good to a good deal longer distance than Ethernet can possibly go. Have we about beat that one up? Okay. Let's move on to another DMX myth. Myth number two. Connecting a terminator at the end of a DMX run causes problems. Heard this a lot of times where people have said, gee, you know, every time I plug in a terminator at the end of the line, it causes problems or everything quits working. I, I run without a DMX terminator. My very short answer to this one is, if you plug in a terminator and it causes the system to, to die, the system should not have been able to work in the first place. There's probably something terribly wrong to begin with. So connecting a terminator may highlight problems that already existed that haven't necessarily instantly tripped you up. I think another thing that's also worth noting here is I hear um, on a literally a weekly basis in some of the online uh, discussions that uh, oh I've never I've never used a terminator in my entire life. I've never never needed a terminator, but yet I still have all these unexplained uh, glitching issues that happen occasionally. Well, if you're having those, you probably need a terminator, and you just didn't want to admit it. But um, it, it's kind of funny. You hear you hear this quite often about um, people in the, the same discussions. You know, people complaining that uh, they never need terminators, they need terminators, and they don't believe in terminators, like it's a, a you know religious view. But um, but then at the end of the day, uh, in the next row, you see all these people complaining about glitching lights and aren't that aren't behaving properly, which are odds are uh, a result of no termination.
But it's it exactly the same argument. <coughs> if what DMX five zone doesn't have to be terminated after all, we get the real protocol, we'll get rid of this job. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the other thing to know about termination is if you have a problem with termination, it is not the last device in line that has the problem. Termination, if you if you take a DMX five twelve signal and you put one device far into the wire, it's probably going to work fairly well. It's when I take a bunch of devices, some of which are in the middle of the ride, because termination takes out echo reflection. And let's take a look at exactly that, Bob. That's that's a good point. Let's take a look at this slide. We're looking at the signal, a DMX signal that uh, is a running over a thousand feet of cable, and we're looking at the 500 point, 500 foot point, the mid span, and this is what the what it looks like. Now, some things to notice here is notice that the uh, you know the numbers on the left represent uh, the ground or common voltage. Notice how the the voltages are lifted off of common, perfectly okay. What we're really concerned with is the shape of the waveform and the fact there's a, that there's a difference in voltage between the top trace and the bottom trace. That's data plus and data minus. This is properly terminated. But let's look at that same point without the termination on it. All of a sudden we have a lot of distortion going on. And this is a digital signal. As we look at this, you know, can you really tell me where the transition from digital one to digital zero is taking place, especially looking at this valley here and such. And with so, that valley, that's the difference between 25% and 50% on that dimmer. That's the difference between pan pointing stage right and pan pointing stage center. All you've got to do is move that valley four microseconds. Exactly. And uh, so th this, is, uh, this is a good example of the light connected to this mid-span, unterminated, is probably going to be doing a dance you don't want to do. If we look at the top blue trace, you'll see something interesting. If you look about two-thirds of the way up, you'll see a plateau, a, pl a sort of flat spot. The distance, the distance between where it starts to rise and where you have that flat spot is the time that it takes the signal traveling at about 0.6 feet of light to transfer down to the entire cable, hit the far end, and bounce back to where you're looking. You're actually seeing an effect that has to do with light speed transmission in a copper cable. And that, on the other one, we don't have that echo because the wire appears to be infinitely long. When the signal goes to the end, it drains out, it doesn't come bouncing back. Which is what the terminator does. The terminator creates the effect of making the line essentially looks like it's infinitely long. It's basically the, the old analogy that's often used is, um, you know, one, at least one of the analogies is used for this, is if you take a, uh, a tennis ball and, you know, throw it down a, uh, a, a, a hallway with no wall at the end, it'll just keep rolling, it'll keep going and going, uh, which is what you want in terms of signal. If you take a tennis ball and you throw it against the wall that's, you know, 10 feet away, it's going to come bouncing right back at you. Um, and that's that's the problem that, that you have in your transmission. If that ball bouncing back at you, they collide with the next ball that you're throwing down down the hall. Now, one of the things that uh, you know, I will throw a concession in here for for some folks. If you run the math out on this light speed that we're seeing in the second half of the slide here, if you run it all out, what you find out is that. It is possible to get away without terminating a cable if it's under 150 feet. It's not good practice. It's not good practice because you don't know when someone is going to add that extra 100 foot cable on the end. So best advice is always have good practice. But if you are up against a wall and the run's 150 feet or less, you can get away with it. Just don't count on that. Even, even on short runs within that yeah. range, I have seen other issues um, where you have a whole lot of fixtures with very short cables, or maybe a lot of short cables connected together, yeah. because each of the connectors causes their own discontinuity and own reflections um, as the signal is going down the wire. So it makes a big difference. If I'm running the signal on, on 
and one single piece of a 100 foot cable is significantly different than the effects I will see if I run it on a bunch of 10 foot cables, 10 10 foot cables connected together, or you know, 25 foot cables connected together. It makes a big difference in what it will yeah. do to the uh, signal that goes down the wire with regards to termination. And the Another thing I'd like to throw in here that often yeah. causes people to think, oh, I don't need a terminator. It's hard to discuss why you need termination without getting into transmission line theory. And if you want to read the technical foundations of this, go find sort of some of the RF theory and the transmission line theory, because that's really what we're dealing with. But in the other corner case where you can get away with surprising things is when you have a console not running RDM, just a DMX console, and then a cable run, and then one device at the end. What you've created there is a classic source terminated transmission line. And in many cases, that will work without the terminator until you have some sort of splice or other problem in the midline. You know, somebody rolls over a cable, you know, a drywall screw nicks it, um, splice starts corroding, then you start having midline reflections, and all of a sudden, your line that was just by pure luck, source terminated, now has the exact same problem that is showing here. Cool. So now you've got the <coughs> example of the lecture on the screen, the different signals, the gate plus and the gate minus. The electronics that's receiving the DMX signal is designed to look for that differential signal. We covered that. We covered that most of it. Yeah. But in respect of termination, um, if one of those signals goes open circuit, so effectively what appears at the receiving end isn't that differential signal, then signals do tend still to work. When you terminate the line, and people say the reason I didn't terminate the line is it stopped me from working, that particularly can highlight where you've lost the data continuity. So mm -hmm. I've successfully uh, listened to people who said, oh, I didn't terminate that because the, the base didn't, uh, these pictures stopped working. And I drew them a little diagram and I said the reason for the termination of stopping things working is because you've got an open circuit and I could predict whereabouts in their cable infrastructure the open circuit was. And lo and behold, they went and found the connector that wasn't wired properly. Yep. So you can actually use that concept of I added the terminator and it stopped working to your advantage in finding what would otherwise have caused you intermittent problems. Absolutely. And just to be complete here and make sure we cover all of the, the basics, a terminator is a resistor of about 120 ohms connected between data plus and data minus uh, at the end of the data run. Would, would another issue be if you're using the improper cable it doesn't have the correct characteristics and adding the terminator screws up those characteristics even worse and that's why it would make, you know, yeah. someone's used a mic cable yep. and you put a terminator on, you really screwed up the equation. Yep, now you formed an RC circuit and made things worse. So we touch into cabling just a little bit later on here too, but that's absolutely a source of issue. Is there another factor where you have a connector involved? Another factor where you have a connector that is not as good at a near drive circuit, which is what we kind of sort of have here. When you put the terminator on, you're pulling the current in the wire away from being a dry circuit. Like you have dry contacts and relay, the ordinary power contacts can't be. So is there a factor where when you terminate, you're ensuring that you don't have is that is that a there's not a lot of current going through these no, cables. But it's you're talking, you know, if you have three volt differential at 120 ohms, that's twenty seven millivolts, which is above what's considered to be a dry circuit. It could be a factor. So that could be why it's something, yeah. you know, you have a connector that say is 10 contact instead of gold. Yeah, absolutely. The terminator okay. might help that work better. <laughs> <laughs> good connection, good connectors in the first place, I think. It's yeah, right. Right. Good that. Good sure. So, does that feel good to everyone? We beat up uh, termination for a bit. Let's take a look at myth number three we've got. This is something I get on a regular basis. You know, we've heard the term slow and fast DMX, and I've heard a lot of people say, oh, you know, oh, yeah, go to a slow, uh, slow DMX. That's when you slow the baud rate down, right? Well, 
two things there. First, uh, the, the term baud rate is actually uh, a misnomer. There, there, it's so like saying rate rate. The word baud means rate. So you're really saying, by saying baud rate, you're saying rate rate. Uh, we're, so we can speak of the data rate or we can speak of the baud, either one. But that's just uh, pedantics. That's me. Sorry. Uh, when we vary, when we vary, and uh, exactly, <laughs> when we start varying the something and calling it a slow DMX signal, what we're really doing is we are varying the timing parameters that are variable in DMX. So here we're showing a what we're calling a slow data rate, and if you look at the two vertical green cursors and the uh, the top green area, it says delta, 96 microseconds. Now, that's the, uh, the time from the beginning of one data byte to the beginning of another data byte. So the, uh, the high time in there is the idle time. And uh, the idle time between bytes is variable in DMX. The break time is variable in DMX. And the mark in after break time is variable in DMX. But the data itself, the bits, are not variable. They are absolutely four microseconds, plus or minus, what is it, a quarter or a half microsecond? So the, the standard, I think, requires 2%. Right. So in this case, we're calling this slow DMX because if we add up the, uh, the time of the absolute <laughs> bits, then the slow or the, the fastest time we can have looks like this. Fastest time we can have is 44 microseconds between bytes. In the case on the left, there's 96 microseconds between bytes. But it's only the interbyte time that is being varied here, not the bits, not the data rate, just the idle time between bytes. And Notice too, I think I, Scott was going to pick this one up about what can and can't listen. Yeah, well, there's a couple things here. You know, the other thing is, is um, sometimes the, uh, the item time doesn't necessarily have to be put in between bytes. Other controllers may um, send the data out with the same inner byte spacing, but they just leave a dead time between one packet of data and the next packet of data. Mm -hmm. So, I think one of the things that's important is uh, to know is is that on a console you may have, you know, you could, you could change the speed of DMX, if you will, um, but there's a lot of different timing parameters um, that can be involved, and it's not necessarily adjusting all of those, and it may not necessarily be adjusting the ones that, you know, you need for the problem you have. It doesn't hurt to try it, certainly if you're experiencing issues, but um, it's, it's oftentimes it's important to understand um, you know, what, what is the specific kind of parameter that's affecting you. Um, and, and if a product is built properly, you sh it should work within the range of the specification, within all the timing ranges, and not be particular about what it receives anyway if it's compliant with the standard. So there's no oh, industry standard for slow DMX or speed DMX or fast DMX. No standard. So, <laughs> Two companies could call their iteration and implementation of DMX being their slow mode and actually be completely different in terms of their timing characteristics on the one. Absolutely. You were about to speak, say something, Eric? Yeah. You know, the, the, I, I see a lot posted online that people say, oh, you know, this fixture only works up to 15 hertz, or I'm running my DMX at 40 hertz or 30 hertz. The, that is the total refresh rate. It is the number of null start code packets that you are getting per second. But if all you know is the break length and the refresh rate, you basically know nothing about your timing. The things that cause problems for poorly implemented fixtures, it's not the refresh rate, it's not the break length. It is the timing within the packet. So when you hear somebody say, oh, it works at 30 hertz, they're really saying nothing. You have to look deeper into the timing of the packet. Absolutely. And, and even to that regard, it can also be, um, you know, one of the, one of the Critical timing aspects for, for you know automated lighting is um, basically the number of packets that are coming in a second. So when a packet comes in, once it's finished getting the packet, is when the light typically goes through and starts decoding that packet and you know recalculating all of the motor, new motor positions and new intensities and things like that, and what the light should be doing. 
So the more frequently those are coming in, the less time it has in between them to do all those calculations and everything else. So sometimes you'll find on, on you know, inexpensive or poorly made equipment, if the data, if there's too much data for it to process in a given amount of time, that can, that can cause an effect as well. One other thing, there is no prize for perfect BMX. Um, many years ago, there was this company who manufactured BMX drive receiving cards and driver cards. And they gloried in the fact that they produced a 88.0 microsecond break. They produced an 8 microsecond point zero zero mark after break. And that this made them perfect BMX. Um, it, uh, absolutely valueless. While there are reasons to sometimes keep your data rate up to reasonable speed because you do want your light to function correctly, or you may have to back off a little bit, as Scott said, your unit should work when it is hit with the, with the fastest legal DMX. But there is no reason that anybody should, want, other than test equipment, should try and generate the fastest to the letter DMX. It, 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 isn't, it isn't something you need to know about. It isn't something that's going to produce better results. OK. Sounds good. So I think we understand what slow and fast means now. Let's take a look at another one, myth number four. The maximum DMX update rate is 44 hertz, just as we've been talking about, sort of connecting this together. Now, speaking directly to what Bob was just saying, here's, here's what a note that came directly out of the standard says. Given the range of time and parameters shown in tables six and seven, a transmitter may produce a signal with a refresh rate in the range of one hertz to approximately 830 hertz. A receiver must be capable of accepting a signal with a refresh rate of 0.8 hertz to approximately 836 hertz. Now, this goes to a number of things. Slow DMX, fast DMX. Well, if you run the, if you run the math out, you find that the fastest you can have an update rate with 512 slots of data in a DMX packet is in fact 44 hertz. So where is this 830 or 836 coming from? The packet is short. The packet is short. DMX 512 packets are not required to have 512 slots of data. They can in fact have well, well, one. one yeah. it is, it's legal to have one mm -hmm. slot of data. And, in, and this is where you know, I personally run into a lot of receivers that if you start running short packets, they aren't able to really receive. And, and again, if you run this all out, 830 updates per second is perfectly possible and, and should be receivable according to the standard. A receiver must be capable of accepting 836 updates a second. However, there has to be a certain required length for the entire packet, uh, which works out at, with the new timings, I'm not sure, but somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 uh, slots mm -hmm. per packet. Right. If you are below that, you will end up having to add padding to not go uh, to not go over the top. Speed. Which is that, is that you are sending more bytes even though they're not there. You are see, it looks like you're sending more bytes, but they're not there. Yeah. Um, the number on the original DMX 512 was 1196. The newer one is in the just state like they here. And um, it's, it's, it's worth noting if you happen to be a manufacturer, especially a controller manufacturer, listening. While you can do this, it is not a good idea. It is, uh, the, the standard did allow it going back to 1986. It's mostly a historical artifact, which is how the numbers worked out. But uh, most all controllers, I, I tend to see at least, do always send out 512 packets, or 512 uh, slots per packet. Um, you can send shorter, and it's okay to, to send a bit shorter, but um, I, I'm going to say this is probably one of the least tested corner cases for um, in-device manufacturers, you know, like moving lights, for them to actually test something with data rates coming in this fast. So. Eric, do you have something? Yeah, where this does end up being done is when you're using things like strobe lights and where you, you know, where, you know, with human perception being on the order of small tens of milliseconds, 
and you want to make sure that you're able to do faster, faster flash sequences or other things, you'll see them sending shorter packets more frequently to be able to do tighter sequencing of strobe sequences. I've also seen it done to get higher refresh rate on LEDs that are synced to higher frequency video. Yep, absolutely. Cool. So I think we have a little better understanding of update rates. Let's take a look at number five. This number five. Okay. I'm getting on my soapbox here, so everybody just get ready, okay? 3-pin XLR connectors are fine for use in DMX systems. Okay. Are these allowable connectors? Several are. The 5-pin XLR on the left? Yes, that's okay. The terminal block, is that an okay connector for DMX 512? In the original standard, it was never mentioned. The connector shall be a 5-pin XLR. In DMX 512A, we made the allowance for terminal blocks and things like permanently installed dimmer racks. So, yes, it's okay. How about the RJ45 connector? Is it okay for DMX 512? Sometimes. Sometimes. In fact, yes, under certain conditions, the RJ45 is acceptable for use in DMX 512. And if you uh, look at the standard or the recommended practice, you'll find the uh, recommended pinout for doing that. The restricted situations where you uh, can use it is in things like control rooms, patch bays. What we specifically do not want to see is an RJ45 mounted on a wall in a publicly accessible area that says DMX 512 on it. The, uh, basically, if on equipment, if there's room for an XLR connected to 5 XLR, then you're not supposed to use RJ45. And the RJ45 is not to be used as a portable cable. And category cabling is not to be used as a portable cable. Can be used for installation purposes. It was mainly intended for, um, because it is, it is okay to run the DMX 512 signal over category, you know, five or six cabling. Um, so it was mainly intended for, um, when we put it in the standard, to allow for structured cabling systems where the whole building is basically being wired at the same cable, the same contractor doing it. So in an equipment closet, you can have, um, you know, you could, they can outfit everything with RJ45s in the equipment closet, and then you could um, patch in, um, you know, using uh, RJ45 connectors there. Um, and it makes it easier to convert it, you can turn it later on. But as uh, Milton said, it should not ever be, uh, the other end of it should not ever be accessible to, uh, you know, to the user. So the last connector, the three pin XLR, is that okay for DMX usage? No, it is not. Let me say this very clearly. The DMX 512 and DMX 512A standards never have allowed the three pin XLR connector for DMX usage, never. Further, the DMX 512A standard specifically disallows the use of the 3-pin XLR for DMX. If a device has 3-pin XLRs on it and says DMX, it is not a DMX device, period. There is no discussion, there is no argument. 3-pin XLRs are not acceptable for DMX. And I will take anyone to the mat who wants to argue about that. <laughs> okay, now, here's one, here's one very important reason why. Take a look at these adapters. There is no earthly reason why every technician in the field should be condemned to carry these adapters around with them all the time. As a good example, a talk I gave a little while back, I took a mouse and I connected the cable of the mouse to two stage pin connectors. And I handed it to someone and I said, connect this thing to your USB. And they said, these aren't USB connectors. I can't connect it to my computer. I said, exactly. Those aren't USB connectors, and that 3-pin is not a DMX connector by the, same, by the same token. Some will make the argument because you don't necessarily need all five pins. So what? Your DB9 connectors with your RX-232, if it's a GPA connector, don't necessarily use all pins. 
Exactly. So, I say, these adapters are just sort of a, a travesty to, to me. I put a lot of this back on the user, I'm afraid. Why are there three pin connectors being used in the field for DMX? Because the consumer allowed it. It should be five pin XLR. I have a religious fervor about this, so I'll let others speak to it if they wish. So we also taking a step back to the question from the web uh, Yes, please. Asking why we have a fervent disallowance of RJ45 category cable to be a portable cable in addition to the XL12. Good question. Yet now we're clearly using it for shooting away from Yeah, it's a good question. The, the big reasons there that we don't want DMX over RJ45 is because the RJ45 is inherently not a rugged connector. It also has a very limited number of uh, mating cycles on the order of uh, two to 500. I'm looking at my colleagues to, to confirm or deny. So it, it is not a rugged connector and uh, DMX is intended to be in hostile environments. So that's the primary reason for that. Ethernet, that's a different thing. The RJ45 connector is actually very well impedance controlled and Ethernet will not make it through a rugged connector like an XLR. Others want to add into that? Well, it's also about promoting interoperability. You know, that the, the sort of back of house, um, you know, use of structured cabling is a bit of a concession to sort of how buildings have been wired for the past decade. And because so many contractors and things understand structured cable, it's suboptimal to use, but it is allowed for sort of things where it's not being plugged day to day and not exposed to the sort of rigors of a show. Um, the reason out on the stage areas, out in the areas that are accessible to stagehands that are seeing the, the rigors of daily plugging and activity is both to get to ensure the interoperability that if it's a five pin, if, if, you know, if you plug it in, it should work, barring a couple of five pin stereo audio mics, you know, if it fits, it should work. And about in promoting the interoperability of being able to do that. There are some very good um, ruggedized RJ45 connectors, but if, if you're mixing those, in, if, if you're intermixing those, it really hurts the interoperability. And that is why we're really pushing the stuff that's used day to day needs to be an XLR5. For the same reason, uh, it's bad enough that Milton Point has these 35 5 3 adapters. So now I'm going to mix a uh, 5 to uh, so RJ45, an RJ45 5, an RJ45 to 3, a 3 to RJ45, and you know, it, it, it starts getting just really painful really fast. I think the real answer is what Milton said, which is you can't run Ethernet down an XLR. It's a more rugged connector, and if you could do Ethernet over that kind of thing, then you would be better off for it. The best thing you can run Ethernet over is the category cable, and without another standard category cable, for uh, four block cable. And, and the, the, one of the reasons, one of the main reasons the 5 pin XLR was chosen back beginning of DMX Live 12 was for protection for the user because and there was actually a column in the very old lighting connections where somebody it was a three pin XLR DMX Live 12 system and during a dinner break somebody tried to plug in their guitar amp into the DMX Live 12 line and blew out the system because that three pin had voltage on it blew out all the components. The only saving grace was it was a disco show and most of the users didn't realize it was an issue. <laughs> <laughs> it much different. So it, it was done for protection, so by using the free thing, you would expose yourself to maybe the technicians know the difference, but somebody else comes on there, free thing, free thing, plug it together, and they let the smoke out. So, Jason, did that address the caller's uh, the question? I see no further complaints. Okay. And, Hopefully that, and not ahead. only does the DMX risk damaging the audio equipment by blowing out your speakers, the audio risks damaging your DMX equipment via high voltage phantom power. 
yet mm-hmm. another reason that the three pin is cross plugged. If with the the phantom power exceeds the common mode rating of the RS-485 standard. It can and will blow out an entire line of DMX, the console and everything on it, if you cross plug into phantom power. Absolutely. So, cool. I think we got that then. This is the connector. Go ahead. the fact that there are no cables in the audio market with the three pin XLR. So the characteristics of that cable aren't suitable for transmitting reliably over the long distances we talked about that DMX signal. So because the choice of connector differentiates you in terms of the cable you're likely to encounter in particular Yeah, there's, there's been a, a long running debate in some of the online discussions too I've seen about what, you know, is it a um, uh, is it an XLR cable? Because the, the call the call anything with the three pin on an XLR cable, regardless of the date type of wire that's in between. Um, but yeah, a, uh, a five pin on top of an X cable. Um, but yeah, but there's there's some weird weird myths and nomenclature around mm-hmm. the cable. Um, the, the, they call the, the cable by the connector, not by the actual wire, which is what it's comprised of. Yes. Yeah. As, a, as an equipment manufacturer and collectively, what can we do about you know to at least slow the propagation of these used five pin connectors in your equipment? It's always demand when you ship it with that, and you're talking a well, large order. I mean, what do you do? And so, how much? How much? What can be done further to help? Um, those customers so that they realize there, there are no DM, there are no DMX police out there, and the best we can do is to educate people, and and you know direct them toward this webinar, uh, you know why why things are the way they are and why it's important. If people understand that it is important, they'll they'll choose the right way. Put both connectors on. Put both connectors on. I'd rather see it five pin, but yeah. that's me. Well, put the right connector on, and then shift the adapters in the pocket. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. If they need them, they'll be able to find them. Yeah. <laughs> so let's uh, now that we've gotten to the connectors. Let's pick on uh, what they're connected to. Myth number six: Any twisted pair cable is okay to use for DMX. I hear this every week from electricians. And well, let's take a look at cabling. Things that are important about DMX cabling has to have a nominal impedance of 90 to 120 ohms, 15 picoparads per foot or less of capacitance. Cable is the two conductors running side by side form a capacitor. The bigger the capacitor, the more it deforms the signal along the way. So low capacitance per foot is important. Also, it needs to be a shielded twisted pair cable. So here are some typical examples of uh, of cables that are acceptable. There are a lot of others, but these are ones that uh, that we tend to see a lot of the time. Uh, what isn't shown here is the Category 5, Category 6, and as we talked about earlier, Category cables are acceptable under certain circumstances. Not as portable cables, but uh, but they are workable. So, but why, why twisted pairs? What is that bias? Take a look at this. This is uh, just an illustration of uh, what's called common mode noise. By twisting two wires together, if we expose the, those wires to a, uh, to a source of radiation, in this case, you know, we've got you know, the common mode noise source. Perhaps it's a handheld radio or something like that. And it's emitting signal and uh, attacking these wires. The, uh, the key there is that by twisting the wires together, the wires have pretty much equal exposure to the noise that's being induced. If the wires were just parallel side by side, one wire could block or shield the other wire from the noise. By twisting them, the noise is induced equally on both wires so that we can uh, decode it at the other end. Go ahead, Bob. Of course, you'd say, well, why does that help? Because you're adding signals to both wires. Both wires are jumping up in the air. It doesn't really make that matters worse. And the answer is you'll notice that our little transceiver triangles here, actually, they don't have plus and minus signals on them, unfortunately. 
one of those wires in inputs looks to, to see if the signal is more positive than the other wire. And therefore, quite simply, the receiving, the transmitting block sends out signals that are equal but opposite of each other as it draws. And the receiver at the other end wants to know the difference between the two cables. They can be at, they can be at zero volts, they can be at three volts, they can be up to five volts. But the question is the difference between them for a for a positive signal, the positive in the positive pin will be higher than the negative pin. For a negative signal, the negative pin shall be higher. The differential nature of the transmitter and the receiver and the canceling effect of the three pin cable together cause DMX512 to be a remarkably robust signal in a in a in a shitty environment, i.e. a theater. Exactly. <laughs> so so that's why we use the twisted pairs. And the other electrical characteristics make it so that signal can propagate down that cable successfully. Well, one of the other things that's also um, that stuck with me over the years is uh, you know, one of the experts at Belden years ago told us as we were talking about you know, what, what provides more immunity in different situations is that we we're researching category cable acceptability. And one of the, uh, one of the interesting things in you know, that effort was that um, from from their view, the the differential you know signal, the twisted pair nature, actually provided more immunity in their view than, than even what the shielding did. Mm -hmm. the, the differential, yeah, the data, the data range that we operate at, that the the shielding um, was beneficial, but it's the, the, the twisted pair nature of it is uh, where we get most of our immunity. So let me go ahead and move it on as we're. Uh, I'm sure can I stop yeah. you for one moment? It would have been nice if we didn't do that drawing. We should, we should put the return wire in because either shielded or not, having the third connection, which is basically the reference point, which or may not work if it is only two wires connected. The third wire is not only the shield. It references the, the two trans, the transmitter and the receiver to each other. Yep. Uh, there were times when certain large lighting companies, for, we, for quote unquote, the only way we could get through the UL, basically put 10,000 ohm resistors in their ground wires. And well, it works okay with some transceivers, but not with others, because they're essentially running with pin one, which is the common open. Yep. Cool, thank you. Let's move on to the next. Just a, a quick look uh, the effects of mic cable. Microphone cable typically has a high impedance per foot. Here's what, the, what happens when we're driving a DMX cable and uh, we suddenly stop driving it. You see the curves on the, on the line. And this is the, the capacitance of the DMX cable and the capacitor discharging. It happens pretty quickly versus microphone cable, it takes much, much, much longer. Notice that I'm on a completely different time scale. Each of this, these little white spaces here is the same as a big white space here. The mic cable took forever to, uh, to drain its capacitance. And the result is that it distorted the signal very, very badly. Uh, again, don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but just so that you have some sort of visual example of Things you know, a cable does have an effect on. So a lot of people talk about talk about the uh, uh, the impedance of the cable being a critical thing. And in my experience, it's, it's a capacitance. Oftentimes, it's even even more of a uh, an effect than the impedance. Absolutely. Another side note, uh, you know, as we talk about mixing audio and DMX, there's one kind of audio which is digital audio AES EPU audio cable is a very good cable for DMX usage. It, it is the right characteristic uh, impedance and uh, twisted wrong pair. Connector. It's the wrong connector, but the cable itself, AES, EBU, digital audio cable, is good for DMX, and it's really thin and flexible stuff. Well, you have another question on the WebEx. Sure. Uh, asking, what about two universes that have a single cable and two twisted pairs? Is that considered acceptable? Absolutely acceptable, and the 512A standard defines that under one, under, under one of the enhanced functionality 
definitions, and if anyone can remember what it is, they get the cookie award tonight. It, it, it may be discouraged, no. but it is allowed. It's allowed. Yes. Because it's historically allowed. Pins four and five yeah. are an alternate data pair, and another universe of DMX is alternate data. It's okay to do that. But, but again, that will come down to all of the table and then the crosstalk between the pairs. So often, you know, your table construction is there and you're not going to show At the data rates of DMX crosstalk, it's not negligible. Yeah. 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 It's really more than screw rate of it. EF4. Yeah. EF4. Enhanced functionality four. Well, good question. Thank you. Uh, again, one last one on the table. Yes. If you don't use the right table and you probably need some factors to support, you won't get much of anything. Yeah, I, I regularly get the phone call that says, can I use this cable for DMX? And I will look it up and say, no, it's really a very poor choice. Well, I really need to use this cable. And they're, you know, in my terms, they're looking for me to co-sign their BS. And, uh, and I usually conclude by saying, when it doesn't work, please don't call me. Um, and if it does work, good for you, but it shouldn't. So, okay, to move on, yeah. let's take a look at number myth number seven. DMX for, is fine to use for pirate control as long as you know what you're doing, <laughs> right? Oh, okay, yeah. here's a good example I got off the web this yeah. afternoon, and you know, my first reaction to this is, seriously? No, just no. Well, the problem <laughs> with this one, with this picture, is that it's a static device. The, the more impressive ones are the moving head plane throwers uh, that are DMX controls that are out there. Um, sadly, these things exist. Um, so one of my issues with this is, uh, first off, the, uh, uh, the standard specifically says it is not used for hazardous conditions. Obviously, some people have different definitions of hazardous than maybe I do, uh, but anything that can cause life safety issues uh, it definitely falls under the category of hazardous. Um, and the reason why is that DMX has no error checking. Um, its, it's method of, of um, you know, data integrity, basically, is that it just keeps sending the same values over and over. So if I miss a packet, if I drop a packet, if there's a glitch in a packet, it doesn't really matter. The next one will be along in, in a few microseconds. Um, <clears throat> the problem is that uh, in plain storage, if you have glitching, if you have other things, you know, if you plugged your um, moving yoke uh, flamethrower into DMX and then you didn't terminate it and you're getting reflections that are causing data errors, um, now you've got a serious problem on your hands. And the, the issue is that even with, um, even with termination, even doing the other things right, there's a whole host of issues that can cause, cause the thing to not function. Um, if somebody is, you know, stepping through queues and they're not aware that, uh, you know, before a show, they're not aware that the flamethrower is enabled, you know, obviously you may end up barbecuing them. Uh, the other issue is that I often hear is, oh, but if I put, you know, a safety system around it, then that makes it okay, right? You know, if I have some kind of deadness, which that makes it okay. In 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 an argument sense, the, the technical person. Yes, technically to a degree, but the problem is, the bigger problem is, is that the, it, you're still relying on the person who is running the lighting to also be the pyro operator now. And they've got more things to focus on than safety. And typically the lighting, lighting people, especially you know, programmers, they're not, they're, they don't have the life safety mindset that a rigging operator does or that a pyro operator does. Um, so I often hear also like, well, uh, I see pyro systems out there that have DMX input on them all the time. But again, even in that situation, that's not necessarily a good idea, but in that situation, you've got a completely dedicated pyro system with a pyro operator, and the DMX is really just coming in as a, more of a show control signal to, to you know, control the timing of when it happens. But you still have somebody dedicated there to the operation. So the DMX in that situation is just making a request that a pyro be fired. Yeah, you've got somebody there who is watching out for the life safety operations, and they have a you know completely separate um, safety system in place to, to control the integrity of what's going on. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ye
Another question that I see a lot is, well, can, can I make this safe if I require, you know, 37 different slots set to different values and do this magic sequence dance of cues? That makes it safe enough to do this, right? Because it's not going to fire accidentally. And the answer to that is no for a couple of reasons. Even if you've tried to work around the error correction and the personnel issues and, the, you know, the human mindset factors of life safety systems, the software and lighting consoles is not designed up to the standards that you would see in a proper pyro or other safety system. You know, I think we've all seen that consoles suddenly start following an auto-follow sequence for reasons we don't understand, or something weird happens, or your macro misfires, or the console just wigs out. They're not designed and they don't have the kind of testing. You know, if you fire a cue at the wrong time, you're a little embarrassed, and, you know, you try and get it better the next night. If you fire a cue along at the wrong time and barbecue an actor, as Scott said, that's a real problem. So the whole system, from the protocol to the software that's driving it to the way it's implementing, is just not reliable enough for life health safety systems. And the people, and operating, it. The people operating it as well are not typically trained in that. And I hear a lot of people say, oh, it'd be fun to learn how to do pyro. I can you know, do it as a side thing. In fact, you know, if you're going to, I, my common reaction is that if you're going to do pyro, if you're going to do rigging, then be a pyro person, you know, be a rigger, do that full time. You know, it's not a hobby. You, you should not do life safety functions as, as a hobby because they're hobby. Okay. My <laughs> feeling is that the same can be said about mechanization controls. Now, I don't mean something that moves some little object that's permanently seven feet or eight feet above the stage. Or big hydraulic controls. But if you're talking about something that moves an object through space that could be inhabited by an actor, you do not want to do it with um, DMX-512. And again, it's not only the DMX-512 errors with the console and so forth. It's the moment you take and you give more responsibility the more things that one person has to do, the more likely they're in amateur theater. Therefore, you have the one person who's running the sound, pushing the go button on the console, mm -hmm. and, has, and has to be queuing up the next sound cue while the motion control is zooming across where the actor just fell in front of it. Yep. The, the point is, you don't have the staffing. You've taken, you know, as you said, one person watching the pyro, you also should have one person dedicated to mechanization. Okay. And we may be being realistic, but it's clearly laid out in the DMX standard that hazardous uses are not intended. Well, I think we've barbecued this one. Yeah, we've barbecued this one. Let's go ahead and move on. The next thing we've got coming up is you know, move into RDM. We only have a little time left, but the thing that I think is important here is that it, if we dispel and solve a lot of the problems of DMX, a lot of the RDM problems or perceived problems go away. So let's take a look at myth number one. RDM uses the spare pins of the 5-pin XLR to communicate, pins four and five. Well, simply no. RDM, RDM uses pins one, two, and three. The data is bidirectional. Pins four and five of the 5-pin XLR connector are not used for RDM. And they never were. They never were. There, were, there was another manufacturer who had a different protocol who used pins four and five. It was not RDM. RDM uses pins one, two, and three. Pretty simple myth to dispel, uh, just something that we need to know. So RDM myth number two. Everything connected to an RDM network must support RDM. Or RDM will make my lights flicker. Uh, okay, Have you had, you've had that experience. All of us have had that experience. Here's what the RDM standard says about that. Key goal of the standard is to allow the use of new and legacy DMX512 receiving devices in mixed systems with new E120 RDM equipment and provide straightforward path to upgrading and so forth. The key, the key here is that RDM was specifically architected to allow mixing of RDM equipment and Compliant, big word, compliant DMX 512 gear. If a piece of uh, DMX 512 gear starts flickering and flashing in the presence of RDM, it is not compliant with DMX. It's not RDM's fault. It was wrong in the first place. It was just masked over. 
Other comments from others? Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of the points is, is, is a, uh, as a standards body group here, we went to great, um, often excruciating pains in some cases to make sure that there would not be any interoperability issues with RDM and DMX 512, you know, complying with DMX 512 devices, regardless of what their age was, going all the way back to, you know, things implemented the uh, original 1986 version. Um, so we spent a lot of time working on, you know, addressing this and, and testing and everything else to make sure that, you know, if you have a product that was built and is compliant to DMX 512, the presence of RDM will have no negligible effects at all. And, um, you know, we established that. The problem is, is there's, there's a fair degree of devices out there that are just simply not compliant to DMX 512. And the most common one is things that don't check the start code. Um, that was required in the ninth, original 1986 version of the standard required you to check the start code. Um, and that's true, you know, true then, it's true today, but there's still a lot of products out there. Um, typically, you know, cheap ones from overseas in the value line where they, they you know, ignore that. Um, maybe because they don't understand it, but it's simply one line of code typically to, uh, to, to solve the problem. So that's just a myth that uh, we want to get out of the way. RDM does not make compliance stuff like this. Uh, there are widgets out there available that can turn, can strip out the RDM information so you can, if you need to, run non-compliant gear in the presence of DMX or uh, in the presence of RDM. So there are a bunch of those out there. So let's take a look at another myth. RDM myth number two. Number three, RDM's a neat idea, but it really hasn't been made public yet. Well, you know, sorry, wrong, yes. Look here, it was, here's the 2010 date on the most recent version of RDM. It was originally a re released in 2006. It's been around for 10 years. So RDM is out there, it's available, it's real. And we're actually seeing a lot of it in our plug fest here and uh, trying a lot of things out and I'm seeing a lot of things working together. Other, other input and comments? Not on that one. Well, here's an, here's an important thing. Myth number four, that it is a reasonable approach to controlling a coffee pot. Well, you know, really, you know, it's probably not the best thing, but it's a really uh, gag gift. So, you know, sorry, shameless plug in there. And it's adequate coffee, though. <laughs> it's adequate coffee. Whatever you can get out of Mr. Coffee. So. RDM myth number five, and I believe the last thing that we've got up here. An RDM-enabled device will report massive amounts of information about itself. Well, maybe. You know, at a minimum, a product must support being discovered, information about itself, its software version, can identify itself, and set its DMX start address if it uses DMX information. And you know, beyond that, it may not tell you much anything else. Uh, all of the other commands in RDM are optional. Labeling the device, getting information about temperature and describing itself, uh, telling you of error conditions, all of that stuff is optional. Check, check your manufacturer before you buy, see what the, the widget you want to buy, what it reports, what do you want it to report. RDM is, uh, is, is very, versatile and uh, different manufacturers implement different things. Just want to go back to your coffee pot. Oh, the coffee pot. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. So you said the myth was it's a reasonable approach to controlling a coffee pot. That is a myth because RDM is not designed to control things. It's designed to configure things, to allow the configuration. <laughs> so good point. It, it, it is a reasonable to use to configure your coffee pot to say today I want black coffee or white coffee or red coffee or whatever it might be. But in the context of all this equipment that's the DMX equipment underlying it, the DMX signals are doing the control. And it's the use of RDM to do the configuration. Good catch, Peter. Uh, Thanks. Peter wins that one. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Cool. Uh, a corollary to another question we had on WebEx uh, is to the pyro question. And the question is, is 131, because it's over Ethernet, better for pyro? Oh my god, that was worse. We'll get to that. <laughs> but that uh, <laughs> uh, the part of the question is, would RDM be more suitable for pyro? No. 
No, it was because RDM is not a control mechanism. It's a configuration and reporting mechanism. It is not a control mechanism. And, and even though you know somebody could do something and could affect control with it, um, and some would say, oh, but it's got a checksum in there, so it's all good. Well, yes and no. Um, yes, there's a checksum in there, but it's 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 what's from by safety standards considered a very weak checksum. Um, it would not be adequate for a life safety application. In fact, the matter is, is, is RDM is not designed, again, for life safety applications. If you're doing anything that involves life safety, there's a whole lot more, you know, you've got to consider and design around than, than what has been done in this protocol. Um, and on the E131 question, um, the reason I say it's actually worse is because with, with BMX 512, you're sending constant stream of packets down the wire, even if it's redundant information the entire time. With E131, um, once you uh, once the value stops changing, you don't have any slot values changing, there's no cross phase running, then uh, it doesn't keep sending the same redundant packet down the wire all the time. It drops down and only sends a redundant packet maybe once a second. And uh, if I miss the, if I you know drop the Packet that told me to turn off the pyro, and uh, I've got to wait, you know, another second or second and a half before I get the next packet um, to to stop the flame flamethrower. You know, that that can be a long time if something is going wrong. Eric, did you have some input there? Yeah, so I was going to say, in addition to what Scott mentioned about the problems with using E1.31, it's even more so than DMX because. With E1.31, you can have multiple sources on the line. So if you have Universe 21 controlling your pyro, and then somebody accidentally or, you know, however brings a, another console or another controller online that sources that same universe, it's going to control it just because it's plugged into the same network. And so your, your sort of risk scope grows even further beyond what Scott was mentioning. And, and plugging a, a, a uh, E131 streaming ACM to the DMX gateway in doesn't make any of this any better at all. Right. <clears throat> so uh, we've uh, we've sort of exhausted our time and run over a little bit here. Uh, you know, any other if, questions? Are there any other questions anyone wanted to bring in? Oh, oh, right. here. Go ahead. Um, something that comes up more recently various conversations with customers regarding RDM is the difference between an RDM enabled device and an RDM compatible device. Ah. Or RDM ready is my favorite one from, uh, from years ago. I'm probably calling RDM ready in the market. You know, RDM ready to me always meant that they hooked up all the pins inside the thing, but there was no software to actually yeah. support it. RDM compatible versus what was the other one? Enabled. Enabled. Hmm, what does that mean? I think <laughs> RDM enabled, it should mean that it actually works. Yeah. Um, compatible could mean any but number of Compatible, that. you could say that a DMX512 product that doesn't blink, i.e. a DMX512 product that follows the original standard, is compatible because I can plug the two together and I can run both of them with the same DMX source. And even possibly have them do exactly the same thing. But all of that would simply, I have no idea of anybody who's defined these terms other than the old DMX ready, which I thought simply meant you had the extra pins and connectors. Yeah, our RDM ready was something that um, when we were in the development stages of RDM before it was released, um, a lot of people were starting to put the hardware in in anticipation of it. So they would market it as is RDM ready. Mm -hmm. um, I remember moving light many years ago when ACN, full ACN was in development. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't know the protocol was nowhere near done. We really had no idea what it was going to be yet. So we just basically put an RJ45 jack on the outside of the fixture that went to nowhere inside that we could presumably drop a PCD in, in the future. Um, but yeah, that was ACN ready. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> RDM ready followed much of the same thing. At least the mint moment, the hardware was there. But it was not actually implemented. The problem is, is this continued on, especially some of the trade publications, um, doing equipment reviews, we're still using the RDM ready term for, you know, a, you know, at least a good six, seven years after RDM was published. 
where at that point it was really meaningless because it, mm-hmm. you know, either you've implemented it at that point or you haven't. And uh, that's with all these terms is either you've implemented it or you haven't. Yep. Um, and and it's it, hard to, you have to ask the manufacturer really when they use a term like that is what does it mean? What does it mean to you? I think it's worth noting that back in the, in the DMX only days, it's actually quite difficult to test an end product's behavior as DMX. You could fire the right DMX at it, but you have to actually know what the product was capable of doing and expected to do. Were the lights meant to come on? Was it meant to whiz around or whatever? So you have to have a sort of human intervention between you sent it a command to do something and observation of the product to know whether it has received that command. You couldn't electronically or in software terms really close that test loop to see whether it was receiving the DMX and acting on the DMX in the manner intended. You had to, to visually look at what did the product do. In this day and age with the advent of RDM, we do now have within the industry tool sets that allow developers of RDM products to close that loop electronically. In other words, to establish whether having sent a particular command to an RDM enabled device, did it receive and respond appropriately to that individual command? So as manufacturers of the product, there is now enough uh, tool sets, if you like, on the marketplace and available through things like the Estes Multiple Plug Tests to better evaluate electronically like the performance of a device that is claiming RDM compatibility. Yeah, so it's, it's compliance testing to ensure that the product actually follows all requirements set forth in the protocol. And, and the it's standard. worth noting there there are no DMX or RDM police out there, and uh, there's no third party compliance uh, group who certifies things. And I think that's a bit of confusion because I think consumers tend to see things like Wi Fi. And then they hear about 802.11, and they think they're the same thing. They're not. IEEE 802.11 is the standard written by the Institute of Electronics and Electrical Engineers to tell how things should work. And then there's a whole other organization that is a standalone company that does nothing but test your product to see if it interoperates properly and give you permission to put that Wi-Fi logo on. There is no analog to Wi-Fi alliance for ESTA protocol. Right. ESTA is specifically not not a compliance business, and that's why we hold you know the plug fest you know typically a couple times a year in different places around the world to allow manufacturers to get together and do interoperability testing amongst themselves. That's our solution. Do you have a question, Roger? No, you had your hand up a moment ago. Do you have a question, Roger? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. But to that point, there, there really is already ready, already enabled. There is no trademark term mark yeah. that anyone can put on that has a what about like you brought up the five points about a picture of start rating uh software version that identify itself and the next next addressing and uh product info. Are those in the standard basically the five that you need in order to claim that your product supports RDM? The, or do you have to give the that yes, I support all eighty eight kids? No, no, they, no, those are the minimum supported requirements. To, to do anything, you must at least product, do that. Every product is different, so uh, it's hard to, you, know, you can't mandate that you must support you know, these kids and you know, these messages and, 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 and not the other ones. Because every product is different. If I'm building a movie, you know, movie line is different from a different, demo line is different from a fog machine. So everybody's, you know, product has different So, so would be a state uh, marketing statement to state that if the picture does support those five minimum traits of the RDM standard, that we do support RDM? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Could, you, could you implement the mandated commands or kids mm-hmm. correctly? then it's legitimate to claim RDM compliance. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. If you don't get that as far as I can say, it's not certified. Yeah. So RDM is, is a good part because that basically is it meets the standard. So yeah. our RDM compliant is, is generally a safe term. I've not seen at least that one this year. What other, what else you support is basically marketing. What do your customers wish to see? Yeah. Yeah. And to a certain degree, then one other thing about those things is that you do properly respect all the commands you do support. You properly do not do anything disastrous with the commands you don't support. So in fact, you do not have to support the 88 or so commands out there, but you damn well had better not do something weird when you have sent 87, as it were, 
Um, and to that end, the standard does speak exactly to how you should react and respond electronically to commands that you don't implement and or understand. Right. And the, fir and the, and the first rule is certainly, you, you know, do no harm. Do no harm. <laughs> do not crash. Do not bring anybody else down. Um, okay. And do whatever your market demands. So we've run about 15 minutes over. Um, do you have one more question? I have a question, just a comment. But so the end user that are the BMX and RDM employees, because when you get a system and you plug it all together and you expect it to work one way and when it doesn't, now you've got a problem, and round tables like this and non compliant equipment, I think, is the, the biggest bugaboo with that because everybody wants the latest blue stain light, but budgetary reasons means that you're going to go do something less than the blue stain. You're going to get a, you're going to get a little bit of bang for your buck, but not a whole lot. And mm -hmm. When the system doesn't work right, it doesn't work the way you think it should. Now you've got trouble, and it just yeah. Absolutely. Okay, that's really about all the time we've got. Thanks to everybody for participating, especially the folks who've taken time online and uh, those who are up at uh, early hours of the morning in Australia. Thank you, Andrew, especially. And um, I think that'll wrap it up for us. Thanks everyone for attending. I'm going to go ahead and mute the room here and end the meeting. Thanks very much. <laughs>